All right, today let's talk about Lagrange multipliers, sometimes called the method of Lagrange multipliers. So what this is, is a method, which is uh, called Lagrange multipliers, which allows us to minimize or maximize a function of several variables, but the variables themselves are not independent. They're subject to, to some constraint. Uh, we usually call this function g of x, y, z. And, uh, the function that we're trying to maximize or minimize is, is often called the objective function. And think of objective as our goal, uh, the goal that we're trying to minimize or maximize or subject to that other constraint. So to begin, let's just look at an example that uses uh, two input variables instead of three input variables as shown in the paragraph above. So here's our example. Our goal is to minimize the distance from the origin. Okay, so that's our goal. And underneath that, that brace there shows that, hey, um, well, we've got a, a function, the distance function for any point in the plane to the origin given right there, the square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's our goal. That's our objective function that we want to try and minimize. And our restriction is we're only interested in points that are in the hyperbola x, y equals three. So that we're gonna think of as our constraint. Um, so we're gonna think of that as g of x, y equals c. So kind of typing this up and, well, before I say that. Um, so it's not actually that bad, but uh, it's a little easier to minimize x squared plus y squared if we sort of ignore the square root. And we're not really ignoring it. We're just acknowledging the fact that square root of x squared plus y squared will have the same minimum output when x squared plus y squared is minimized. So we'll just worry about a slightly easier um, equation. And it will have our same answer. And so let's, let's before, we, uh, before we go any further, let's kind of take a guess and see what we think might happen here. Because sometimes our problem's intuition and then seeing that intuition work. So there you go, that's a, a relatively poor graph in the plane of the hyperbola at x, y equals three. And so I think it's a reasonable kind of thing to think that, hey, if I were to guess, I would guess that the distance is gonna be minimized for those two points. They're kind of directly on that y is equal to x diagonal line, um, kind of at the 45 degree angle from the origin, if you will. Um, and that it, it makes a little sense because pretty much any other point on the on those hyperbolas are gonna be farther away um, to the origin than those two points. So that's our guess, but let's see if the following runners through this method gets us the same conclusion. All right, so let's plot everything we, we know so far. Um, f of x, y equals x squared plus y squared. Well, that's a multivariable function. And if we were to plot it, we would actually have a plot in three space. So we're gonna collapse it down into two space by plotting the level curves for this expression. And this expression, x squared plus y squared, is going to give us a circle if we set it equal to some constant. Um, and so what, I, what I've plotted below in the graph is, remember, this is z equals to that. So z is equal to 25 here it is really the level curve for x squared plus y squared. Whoops, sorry about that. Plus y squared equals 25, like that. All right, so those are the level curves. We see a bunch of different circles of, of different radii. And then we've also plotted our constraint function of x, y equals three on the graph. And so you can think of that as z is equal to three for a multivariable function, z is equal to g x, y equals to x, y. So on this, on this plot, we see that some uh, radius, some circle of different radii have points that intersect our hyperbola and some that do not. Okay, I'm just kind of noting what we can observe. Um, there exists some minimum radius with points still on the hyperbola. And I plotted that in there as a dotted line in purple one. I put a little question mark there to say, hey, we don't know exactly what um, that radius is yet. Um, another thing to note is when that occurs, the circle is tangent to the hyperbola. And what I mean by that is they share the same tangent line. If we were to plot the tangent line here to both our, our hyperbola and our uh, minimum radius a circle that still intersects the hyperbola, they would share the same tangent line. So we also notice that large values of f, in other words, our level curves, so like z is equal to 25, you can also think of that as f is equal to 25, uh, have solutions, whereas small 
values of f do not. Okay, just a bunch of observations from this plot. So since we're going to think of these plots as level curves and uh, g of xy equals xy, notice that the minimum distance to our origin, our goal, the level curve of f is going to be tangent to the level curve of g, of g is equal to 3 right there. So here's the game. What in particular do we know uh, about level curves where when they are tangent? to each other. How do you solve the points x, y, where our level curves f and g are tangent? Well, if you have tangent level curves, the normal vectors are going to be parallel. So let's go back to the plot and kind of draw that on there. OK, so uh, a vector that's normal to the our green plot, g of x equals uh, x, y equals 3, would have um, a normal vector something like that. Um, maybe I should have done that in green. Let's do it in green real quick. I've got a purple pen too, so green. All right. And then the a normal vector to that dotted purple circle, kind of right on top of this, if you will. Yeah. And all right, I'm, I'm pretty convinced there that since these two share the same tangent line, their normal vectors are going to be tangent to each or uh, parallel with each other. Maybe one's longer than the other or something like that. Um, doesn't really matter, but the important part is they are parallel with each other. Okay, so there's a nice little plot of that. So what do you know about normal vectors and level curves? Well, the gradient is normal to level curves. So in this instance, we can think of these, and in fact, they are this, uh, this green area. Let's see, the green is that. So the green is the gradient of G, and the purple is the gradient of F. And we can see that since they're parallel, parallel, they're going to be scalar multiples of each other. In other words, the gradient of f is equal to some, some scalar multiple. Let's call it c, gradient of g. Now, the only difference with this expression down here is that we're replacing c with this little Greek letter, lambda. And so lambda is just a constant that shows that our two gradients, uh, since they're parallel, are scalar multiples of each other. OK, so now here's the slide which illustrates that this only happens when our level curves are what I'm, I'm calling tangent to each other. So we see our good situation over here on the left. And then in, as an example, off to the right, consider the intersection of our level curves, the green level curve for x, y equals 3, and uh, the red level curve for x squared plus y squared equals 9. And then we notice that their uh, gradient vectors point in different directions. They're definitely not scalar multiples of each other. So we won't have this relationship of the gradient of f is equal to uh, lambda uh, multiplied by the gradient of lambda scaling, but rather the gradient of g. So yeah, there we go. Lambda is the scalar. OK, so what the method of Lagrange multipliers actually is, is to exploit the fact that gradient vectors are parallel when level curves are tangent. So we can turn this problem into one of solving a system of equations. So what you, what, when you have, what this expression really means is since the gradient is a vector um, with component expressions, you can then set each of those individual component expressions into a uh, regular old algebra, if you will, equation. The other thing we have to worry about is we have these three equations, but we also have our constraint equation as well. So the system of equations we solve is going to involve the, the relationship we find from the fact that the gradients are scalar multiples, as well as our constraint. That's the entire system of equations. Um, in the case of two variables, well, you wouldn't have, whoops, I should, you and this would be stricken from the record, and that would just be like that. Same idea, just three instead of four equations to solve. In the case of two variables, we'll have three equations and yeah, three variables. In the case of three input variables, you'll have four equations with four variables, which, as you're probably thinking, could be quite a task to solve, a system of four uh, equations of four variables if you haven't had linear algebra yet. All right, so returning to our example, uh, our goal is we want to minimize x squared plus y squared 
And so we're going to calculate the gradient of that. And the gradient of that is taking the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y and whacking them into the x and y components of a vector. So you get 2x, 2y. And our constraint function, g of xy equals xy. And so our gradient of that would be, well, taking the partial with respect to x of xy, the derivative of x is 1. So you're just going to get y and the partial with respect to y uh, with respect uh, the partial with respect to y of x, y is just x. So you get your gradient vector for g as y comma x. OK, so now we have to take this apart and, and unwrap this relationship. Um, so I've got, I don't have it typed on here, but it might be nice to kind of write it like this. OK, so we've got our two vectors, our gradient vector for f, 2x, 2y is equal to lambda times our gradient vector for g, y comma x. All right, so setting these component functions equal to each other, we get 2x has to be equal to lambda y. I guess before we do that, let's go ahead and scale this actual vector uh, g by multiplying the scalar lambda through. And I'm going to fix that in a second. There we go. That needs to be a y. That's a little more clear. Me thinks. Oops. All right, and then our next equation comes from setting the y components equal to each other. And then last but not least, don't forget your constraint function, x, y equals to 3. All right, so what have we got? We've got three equations and three variables. What are our variables? Our variables are x, y, and lambda. Remember, lambda is a constant variable. It's a scalar value. It's a constant. So it's, it's available variable since we don't know that value. So now the game becomes we have to solve this system of equations. Three variables, three equations. We can solve it. OK, I'm going to label them 1, 2, and 3. But let's read the comment first. There, there is no general method to solve the system of equations, which comes out of the, this method of like range multipliers. And, and oftentimes, the algebra is the most challenging part of these problems. Um, but it's nothing we can't handle. So let's take a look at this one. We've got our three equations. And the bits on the left are, these are what we're interested in. Those are our equations labeled 1, 2, and 3, respectively. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm just going to start doing some algebra, trying to solve this system of equations. I've got three variables three equations. I need to figure out what those variables, what values of x, y, and lambda are going to satisfy all three variables. So since the third equation is sort of the simplest, it's only got x and y rather than x, y, and lambda, let's just start with it and solve for either variable. I chose to solve for y because that's kind of a habit we have. And so now let's substitute three, our new version of three that we just solved for, into equations one and two. So substituting y is equal to 3 over x into equation 1, we're going to replace, let's see, equation 1, we're going to replace this y with this y value. And so then that lets us have an equation in x and y, and I chose to solve it for lambda further. OK. Um, thinking ahead, I, I think, well, let's just see what happens. All right, so now we'll, we'll put that into the second equation. So here we're replacing y again with this substitution into that second equation. So we'll drop that 3x in for the y. And then I see that, hey, we have another expression with just x and lambda. So here at this step, I solved both of these new versions of equation 1 and 2 for lambda. And in our next step, we're going to set these guys equal to each other because lambda has to be the same as lambda. So I can set the left sides of the equations equal to each other. There we go. Setting lambda equal to lambda from our prior equation gives us this is equal to this, and this is equal to that. Which, if a little bit of algebra there, you solve that uh, equation. Since it's just an equation with one variable now, we can do that. A little bit of algebra skills. That gives us x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. Okay, what are we going to do with this? Well, what do we know so far? Our goal is to try and find x, y, and lambda values that satisfy all three equations. And truthfully, 
lambda is actually kind of just a temporary variable that we're using. We don't really care if we find the true value of lambda. Um, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not, but we really only need to find x and y since that's what we're really interested in. Okay, so now notice in this process, we've used all three equations. So by back substituting, we have kind of think of this as we've used all of the information we have. We haven't just used two equations and thrown the third one out the window to get their conclusion. If we'd done that, we may not have, um, when, and we back substitute to find the related y value, we'll only have a solution for two, very, two equations rather than all three. So you have to use all the information you have. So we've used all three equations and we can back substitute to find the related y value. So uh, to do that, instead of using those two equations, I chose to use this one, x, y equals three. I have an x value, I'm after the related y value. So I'll just plug uh, positive and negative square root of three respectively into that and solve for the related y. And when you do that, you end up with negative root three, negative root three, and root three, root three, as your two x, y, values that satisfy both of these equations, all three of these equations. Okay, so back to our goal. Our, our goal was to minimize the distance from the origin um, for points on the uh, hyperbola, the green hyperbola there. And notice that, sure enough, as we guessed initially, the distance to the origin was minimized right there on that 45 degree angle line, if you will, y is equal to x. It was the points that we, we suspected and we found our result. So that's kind of an introduction to Lagrange multipliers without actually explaining the process before we did it, just kind of walking it through. Hopefully that was helpful. So here's kind of an approach to the general method for Lagrange multipliers. And as usual, I've written up a bunch of, a few more examples on the site and, and kind of typed up the process as well. So here we go. Again, I'm listing it for the case where you have three input variables. The process is exactly the same for if you only have two input variables. So we've got f of x, y, z and g of x, y, z. They're nice functions, they're differentiable. And note that the gradient of g is not equal to zero when we have g of x, y, z is equal to zero. Well, in our last example, what was g? g uh, was this, it was x, y equals to three. Well, that's not actually just uh, zero. So oftentimes when we do this process, since we're thinking of g as a function, what we do is we take this and we set it equal to zero. So x, y minus three equals to zero. And then we make g into this expression because we're then going to take the gradient of this version of our equation. And so this is necessary uh, for that process to work. Then to find the minimum or maximum of our objective, our goal function f subject to the constraint of g, if such a minimum or maximum exists, we have to solve the system of equations that comes from uh, setting the gradient vectors equal to scalar multiple of each other, lambda. So gradient of f is equal to lambda gradient of g and our constraint function g of x, y, z is equal to zero. Um, so you can, I think most of the time you can technically, you, you don't actually have to rewrite, uh, yeah, never mind. Rewrite it is equal to zero. And so what does this actually mean we're gonna be working with? Well, in the example above, uh, this is x, y minus three equal to zero. And then when we're calculating the gradient, we think of it as g of x, y, is equal to x, y minus three. If your equation is equal to, if your constraint equation is equal to a scalar on the right-hand side, it'll be the same always. But if you have a bunch of x, y variables on the right-hand side, as well as the left-hand side, you have to set it equal to zero. Otherwise your gradient calculation will be incorrect. All right, so let's do a couple more examples. Our first example here, we are going to minimize the distance from the origin uh, of points on a hyperbolic cylinder. So this time we're working with an example where we have three inputs. All right, so well, the distance formula in space is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, the sum of the squares, square root of that sum. And so similar to our last example, uh, we can work with x squared plus y squared plus z squared, losing any, uh, of our conclusion, it's still gonna be accurate. So 
our constraint function then is we only are interested in the distance to the origin of points on the cylinder x squared minus z squared equals one. It's not a cylinder, it's a hyperbolic cylinder. Okay, so first things first, let's kind of set this thing up. Here, identify our objective. It's to minimize that function at the sum of the squares of the x, y, and z coordinates. Um, and then the constraint function is, well, that's what we think of it as generically, is g of x, y, z equals to zero. Since we have x squared minus z squared equals one, we're gonna set that expression equal to zero. And then our g of x, y, z is going to be x squared minus z squared minus one. And again, if, if you had a different constraint function where you had say something like, oh, not a highlighter, say something like y equal to y, give me a pen, equal to y right here, then you would have to subtract that y over. And that's why it matters. That's why we set this equal to zero first. Okay, so there's our, our objective and our constraint functions. Uh, we need to verify that the gradient does not equal the zero vector when our uh, g of x, y, z is equal to zero. So calculating the gradient quickly of g function right here. It's the x uh, partial direction, partial derivative with respect to x is 2x. The partial derivative with respect to y is zero. Uh, the partial derivative with respect to z is negative 2z. Uh, so will that ever equal to the zero vector? when x squared minus z squared minus one equals to zero, that will not. Um, and taking a look at the graph shows us this, but when will this be zero? Well, let's just algebra it out real quick. Well, we would have to have two x equal to zero. That happens when x equals zero. And we would have to have negative two z equal to zero. The y is already zero, so that's taken care of. And so that happens when z is equal to zero. Well, Let's slap these in there. Well, if x is zero, we'd have zero squared minus z squared is zero minus one equals to zero. Huh, we get something that doesn't work. And it turns out that's because the point zero comma zero comma zero is not on our hyperbolic cylinder. So it's not a problem. All right, we wanna find the minimum or the maximum. Uh, in this case, the minimum distance of this shouldn't be yeah. subject to our constraint. We're going to solve this system of equations. So, in order to find the system of equations that comes out of the gradient of f being equal to uh, lambda, the gradient of uh, g, we have to first calculate the gradient of f. All right, so. That shows us that the gradient of f is going to be 2x, 2y, 2z, taking the partials with respect to x, y, and z. The gradient of g, taking the partials, well, we did that before, so we'll just retype that. All right, so those are two. Uh, we have our gradients. Next, we have our constraint function. And putting it all together, you're going to get these equations. I'm going to go ahead and write in the gradients here so that we can see where these equations come from. Gradient of f was 2x, 2y, 2z. Gradient of g is equal to 2x, 0, negative 2z. For some reason, I keep leaving the 2s off when I write the z and coming back for them. So we just set these things equal to each other. The component functions of these equal to scalar multiples of each other, the scalar being lambda. That's where you get these three equations from. All right, and so these three equations, it ends up that just looking at them right away, you can tidy them up. Well, the first equation, two x equals lambda two x, solving that leaves us with lambda has to be one. Um, it's any x value is going to work for there. There are infinite possible solutions in the x uh, for x. So the only useful information we could pull out of that is, in fact, the lambda equals one. Now, looking at our orange equation highlighted, two y is equal to zero. Well, that just gives us two y, or that y must be zero for this equation. 
uh, and then similarly to solve for 2z is equal to lambda negative 2z. Lambda has to be negative 1. And in that case, you again have infinite solutions for z. So we don't kind of get any information there, but get useful information that lambda has to be 1. So that's all the information we could pull out of those equations. Now we have to take into account how they fit together with the constraint function that we haven't yet talked about, x squared minus c squared minus 1 equals to 0. So what do we know so far? So far, we have that lambda is plus or minus 1, and y is equal to 0. So for lambda equals 1, um, that tells us that z is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0, which is a pretty lofty claim without showing any kind of explanation. So how do I make this, this conclusion that z is, in fact, equal to 0 here? Well, for lambda equals 1, let's, let's see what our three equations turn into. So from our prior slide, we're interested in, well, this one doesn't really tell us much, but we're definitely interested in these equations. What happens to them when lambda is equal to 1? So let's take a look at that. We've got 2x is equal to lambda 2x. All right, so that's 2x is equal to, well, when lambda is 1, that's just 2x equals x. So you get an infinite number of solutions there for that. OK, so that doesn't really tell us anything. Great. Now, the other equation, the z equation, is 2z is equal to lambda times negative 2z. Well, if lambda is 1, like we're in this case over here, this becomes 2z is equal to negative 2z. And so the only time that that's going to be true is when z is equal to 0. And that's how we make this conclusion. So when lambda equals 1, we have that z is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0. All right, so what happens when lambda equals negative 1? Those marks are going to go away when I switch this slide. Well, from the first equation, right? so again, our first equation that we're interested in is 2x lambda 2x from the f partial being equal to lambda of the g partial. All right, so. What happens when lambda equals negative 1? Well, we're going to go ahead and replace this lambda with negative 1 here. And so we end up with what? We end up with negative or 2x is equal to negative 2x. Well, let's just go ahead and algebra that out. I mean, you can see already that the answer's got to be 0. We didn't algebra it for the z, but if, if that didn't make sense, here's a quick. But divide both sides by negative 2 or multiply by negative 1 half, whatever you like. You have negative 1x is equal to x. So when is negative x equal to x? Well, if you plug the same in number in for x, doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, the opposite of that is never going to be the same. So that'll never be true. And the only time it actually is true is when you plug 0 in. So, but wait a minute. We mentioned before that x equals 0, that becomes a problem. Here's the actual graph of the hyperbolic cylinder that we're interested in. In red, we have plotted x squared minus z squared equals to 1. And in that blue vertical plane, that's the x equals 0 plane. And so this is, this is to show that we, we don't have any points on the plane when x equals 0 on our actual graph so you can't really minimize the distance to the origin for points that don't have an x value equal to zero so any further algebra or conclusions that we make from this case when lambda equals negative one are going to be extraneous um, nonsense solutions so they're unimportant that we can go ahead and stop our analysis at this point all right so that takes care of the first two cases Let's look at x squared minus z squared equals 1. So far, the only useful information we have are that z is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0. Interesting things seem to happen here. Actually, not interesting things, but they, they solve our system of equations. So we need to find the related x value to those values. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that by taking into account the equation that we haven't yet talked about, the constraint equation x squared minus z squared equals to 1. So when z is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0, substituting in these values, well, we're going to plug the uh, oops, 
it's a rather big arrow, but z is equal to zero, you plug that into the constraint equation, you get x squared minus zero squared equals to one, which leads us to the conclusion that when z uh, is equal to zero and y is equal to zero, we have x, y is equal to plus or minus one. That gives us two points. Those points are, I was a bit lazy and just typed them up as plus minus, but negative one comma zero comma zero, x is negative one, y is zero, z is zero, and x is positive one, y is zero, z is zero are the two points where those systems of equations are satisfied. And they also are the points which are on our hyperbolic cylinder that are closest to the origin where that distance function is in fact minimized, which hopefully makes a little bit of intuitive sense when we look at the plot there. All right, let's do another example. This one we'll call an example B. We're gonna find the minimum or maximum of the function f of x, y equals x, y, on our restrictions that we're only interested in the points that are on the domain of the ellipse, x squared over eight plus y squared over two equals to one. Now the picture makes it look like I'm interested in all the points inside, but uh, that's just because I'm not perfect at GeoGebra. I don't know how to make it just, or couldn't figure out how to make it plot just this, Just the boundary is what we're interested in. We're interested in the minimum and maximum points on the domain uh, just equal to that ellipse. And if you think about that, you plot that ellipse down in the plane, we're interested in just the curve above and below the output points for that input curve. So we can probably, you can probably guess the answer here and say, hey, that's gonna be a maximum, that's gonna be a maximum, this can be a minimum, this is gonna be a minimum, but what are those exact points? Well, we can follow the same process and we'll get there. All right. So uh, we want to find the extrema of x, y on the domain that ellipse. So what are these functions? Our constraint function, well, that's our going to be we're restricting ourselves to the domain uh, of that ellipse. And so we're going to set that equal to 0 and think of it as x, y, z is equal to uh, g of x, y, z is equal to x squared over 8 plus y squared over 2 minus 1. And uh, our f function we already have. Yeah, this gave me a pause because it really doesn't need to be there. All right, apologies there. All right, so calculating our uh, gradients, uh, really, we're relatively good at that by now. Real quick, the gradient of f, uh, since f is x, y, the gradient with uh, the partial of f with respect to x is x, y with respect to x is just gonna be y and partial with respect to x, y is gonna be x. And there's your gradient. Similar uh, logic gets us the gradient of g is equal to one quarter x, um, and then that's another sizable typo there. That's uh, that's supposed to just be a y. So let's fix that. All right. So apologies again. The gradient of g is one quarter x comma y. So apologies that those the uh, corrections are going to disappear, but I promise down the line it's going to here correctly. Okay, so let's set these gradients equal to the scalar multiple lambda of each other. And that's going to give us, since this was y, not 2. Uh, setting the x components equal to each other, we get y from the gradient of x, or f is equal to lambda times 1 quarter x from the gradient of g. And similarly, setting the y components of our gradients equal to each other, we get x is equal to lambda y. And then last but not least, our constraint function, we've got x squared over eight plus y squared over two minus one is equal to zero. So this right here, this is the system of equations that we're interested in. That's what we're gonna try and solve. So tidying that up a little bit. We can now proceed and try and figure this out. So to do this, I'm gonna label these uh, equations so that we can know which ones we're talking about. I'm gonna call this one one, this one two, and this one three. So like I said, the algebra process to solve these is kind of a little puzzle, but oftentimes it can be a challenging process. So my, what are we gonna do? Well, uh, as an idea, I'm going to put two into one. Why am I gonna do that? 
I'm just going to see what happens. Honestly, I'm just experimenting. And, and it may take a little bit of experimenting. Sometimes you can just set lambda equal to each other and then set those equal to each other and try and solve it. But I, looking at these two equations, I see they both have X and Y. I figure maybe if I can solve one for Y um, or X and then substitute it into the other equation and I can, uh, I'll get something that's uh, sort of easier to work with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, all right, we've got equation one solved for Y. So I'm just gonna go ahead and substitute it into equation two like that. When I do that, I'm going to get y is equal to lambda. Um, uh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. I'm going to get, yeah, yeah, I said the wrong thing there. Well, let me just pause and gather my thoughts here. All right, apologize. I lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, we're back on board here. Let me make this highlight a little bit more clear here. I'm going to put equation two into equation one. What that means is since I've got equation two solved for X, I did actually say the wrong thing. I'm gonna substitute it into the X for equation one. Apologies there, I was looking at my notes and kind of got a little mixed up. All right, so now, now let's actually do that. Y is equal to lambda times one quarter times the substitution we're gonna make. We're gonna replace that X in equation one with uh, lambda Y from equation two since x is equal to uh, lambda y. Okay, and so now, now what am I gonna do? Well, now I'm gonna see what I, what I can do from this expression. We're just gonna start algebraing it and tidying it up. Okay, so I've got y is equal to lambda squared over four. Um, and then I'm gonna have another y there. Okay, so the y, I could multiply both sides by one, one over y, and that would reduce away those y's. And then multiplying both sides, that'll get rid of those little guys. So we'll just go ahead and reduce those away. Multiply four both sides. That'll give us that lambda squared is equal to four. Okay. Well, that gives us lambda is equal to plus or minus two, taking the square root of both sides. But caution, when I did something, I kind of threw away a little information. I just, I just recklessly divided both sides by y and, and got rid of a variable. But that variable is still in that equation and it still could be a value and there could be a value for that equation or that variable of y that might solve this equation and make it true. Um, so y is equal to lambda over two, lambda squared over four times y. Well, lambda over four is a constant. And so that's gonna scale whatever you put on the right. Um, so I guess if, if that was one, uh, we would see that y could be equal to one. But just ignore that and think of it as constant and think, okay, what y value would make this equation true? Well, it's another instance where y is equal to zero would also solve this. And so sometimes we just have to be a little clever and, and recognize, hey, zero is gonna work. We better keep track of that as an option. All right, so this equation, is solved for lambda equal positive or negative two or y equals to zero. So let's see what we can do with this information. Let's first take a look at um, y is equal to zero. So in the case when we have y is equal to zero here, well, what, what do we wanna do with that? Remember, we're trying to find a solution for x and y that satisfy all three equations here. And so, I'm gonna go ahead and put this into uh, equation two. And so our new equation two, that's gonna be x is equal to lambda times y. Well, substituting in zero for y, x is equal to lambda times zero. We get x is equal to zero. So this tells us uh, that the point zero comma zero is a potential candidate here. Okay, so that, that well, just through inspection, we can see that that's gonna work for both equation one and equation two. So let's just verify that that does work with equation three because we haven't yet considered equation three. We've got to use all the information we have available to us. And so uh, putting in zero squared over eight, you, maybe you can see it's not going to work already, but I'll just follow my nose through this. This gives us zero minus one equals to zero. Well, that's not true. And so this is, this is junk. It's an extraneous solution. It doesn't actually lead us to where we want to go. 
Okay, so that's that's nice. And basically from here, this conclusion we can say, all right, we're done with y is equal to zero. It's not gonna lead us anywhere good. Okay, so that leaves us with sort of green for good, right? Um, lambda equals plus or minus two. Let's see what we can do with lambda equals plus or minus two, what X and Y values we can find with that information that satisfy all three equations. All right, so, oh no, there's a typo. Well, this is supposed to be not that, but y squared over two. There we go. It's not perfect, but it'll work. All right, so lambda equals two. Let's put this into both equations one and two. So this is equation one, this is equation two, and this is equation three. So we can refer to them again. So substituting lambda equals two into equation one, what do we get? We get that y, oops, y is equal to um, two times one quarter x. And that's gonna give us y is equal to one half x. All right, now equation two under the lambda equals two case becomes x is equal to two y. Well, just out of habit, we'll solve this for y. y is equal to one half x. Hey, these are the exact same thing. So what we're gonna do is since we really only have one equation, we're gonna go ahead and take this and slap it into equation number three because we've used equations one and two so far ensuring we're using all of the available information we have to still use equation three that's going to become well i'm going to replace y with hang on just a second i got ahead of my notes there um we could replace y with one half x squared or i think it might be a little easier and i'm a fan of making things easier on myself when i can why don't we use this version of the same equation and replace x with 2y. That looks like the algebra might be a little bit easier. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace uh, x equals 2y, the x in equation three. So that's going to become 2y squared all over eight plus y squared over two is minus one equals zero. I'm gonna write this as, uh, well, minus one equals zero. I'll move that one over on the next step to make it a little bit more clear. Okay, what do we got here? We've got four y squared over eight. Four y squared over eight reduces to one half y squared plus one half y squared is equal to one. One half plus one half is one. So collecting like terms, we have y squared equals to one, which gives us y is equal to plus or minus one when we take the square root of both sides. So what do we have? Well, this gives us two cases. I'm going to go ahead and kind of make myself a little bit of room here. We have the case where y is equal to uh, positive one, and then we have the case where y is equal to negative one. Well, what are we going to do here? To find the related x, I can remember we have used all three equations to get this far, so we can use any equation we like. Um, to find the related x. And once again, that highlighted green equation seems like a nice choice. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop y equals one into that. That's gonna give me x is equal to two times one. That's gonna give me x is equal to two. And so this gives us the point two comma one. All right, similar logic. X is equal to two times negative one gives us x is equal to negative two, gives us the point x is equal to negative two, y is equal to one. And now notice, since we have used all three equations to get this far, we know that these two points satisfy all our equations, E, Q, and S, my shorthand for equations. All right, so now we have to do the same process for uh, lambda equals negative two. A little bit quicker. Um, once again, these are equation one, two, and three. Substituting lambda equals negative two into equation one, we get y is equal to negative two times one quarter x. That's going to tidy up as y is equal to one half x. And then equation two, substituting lambda equals negative two into equation two, we get x is equal to minus two y. 
once again, uh, if you solve that for, wait a second. Oh, that's careful, Brian. Uh, I was like, why aren't these two things the same? They're supposed to be the same. It's because I dropped this little negative sign. Remember to, let's get that. Let's make that a little more clear. There we go. That'll be my minus. Y is equal to negative one half. All right, solving that, uh, solving the equation on the right for y, you could see that you'll get the same results. So once again, I'm gonna proceed forward with the simpler looking equation, since these two are once again, the same. All right, so we're gonna substitute uh, our new, quote, new version of equation two into the third equation, which we haven't used, just like we did last time. Um, that's going to give us minus 2y squared over 8 plus uh, y squared over 2 equals to 1. But that's actually going to be um, the same math as the last one, because we're going to square that negative 2 and get 4a, which is exactly what we had on this other one. So this is going to lead us to y is equal to plus or minus 1 once again. All right, so now we're going to take that information and find the related x. So y is equal to negative 1 into the highlighted green equation. It is going to give us x is equal to negative 2 times negative 1. That gives us x is equal to positive 2. This is going to give us the point uh, x positive 2, y negative 1. y is equal to positive 1. Similarly, it's going to give us x is equal to negative 2 which is going to give us not a vector, but a point negative 2 comma positive 1. So once again, we've used all three equations. So those two points, x and y, satisfy all three equations. And we've done it. What do we start with? We started with y is equal to 0. Didn't get us anywhere. We had lambda is equal to plus or minus 2. And those got us to uh, four points, 2, negative 1, negative 2, 1. And then from the prior, uh, when lambda is equal to positive 2, we had positive 2, positive 1, and the other point was negative 2, negative 1. So what was our goal? Our goal was to find the extrema, uh, the extrema for this function f of x, y, restricted to the domain of the ellipse. And we found all these points, and then to find the extreme values, we go ahead and plug those in. Notice this is kind of a combination of uh, the last method, the last subject that we learned about finding and categorize, categorizing extrema, um, you can also use this Lagrange multipliers method to do some of that math. And I also plotted the picture. Again, it's not the entire, entire interior of this. It's just the boundary of the ellipse that we're interested in and uh, plotted level curves of our hyperbolic uh, I don't know what I'm going to call this x, y, our, our, our saddle looking surface here, plotted some level curves and labeled them, and then showed that at the point where uh, the level curves of our surface and the level curve of our constraint function are tangent, we have parallel gradient vectors. I plotted a couple of the points, but the other points look similar. And that brings it to this to a close.